gone through this evangelistic effort that was simply the beginning of a two-sided coin. If you think of a coin, a coin has two sides, but what makes the coin a coin is both sizes of the coin. So for us, evangelism and discipleship is a single experience. And I understand that every family, every group that has come on a stage to share about their mission encounters, you know, none of them, as far as we know, have stayed wherever they went. So we just had these young people share about Colombia, but they're not in Colombia, so they're not able to do the follow-up or the discipling of this. They are able to simply convey the gospel, convey Jesus. Jesus transforms the heart, but if we're not careful, many of these families and peoples, they may not continue or specifically grow into the image or the likeness of Jesus in behavior and worldview and actions and speech and decision-making. Because many times there is a disconnect. So for the last 11, 12 weeks, I've been telling you about the, 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 the preaching of the apostles because the book of Acts is a connector between what Jesus said in the Gospels and what Jesus um, meant in the epistles. So when you go to the Roman the epistle of the, to the Romans and you go to Galatians and you go to Ephesians and you go through the rest of the New Testament, there was a disconnect of what Jesus said and what Jesus meant. And, and, and books like the book of Acts, historically, because it's a historical book, is a book that connects those two things. So these sermons, hopefully, they have helped us to, to literally minimize and, and reconnect the, the component of knowing Jesus and embracing the worldview of Jesus. Being saved and behaving like a saved person. So this is Labor Day weekend, and I... I'm so glad that we're celebrating this. I, I think it's a, it's a remarkable holiday for us as a nation because uh, I think work, for that matter, work is something that reflects exactly the holistic view, view of the gospel. Here's my implication, that when you look at the gospel and when you look at the experience of work, we see from the book of Genesis that work is not a result of sin. Many people think that, you know, Adam is commissioned to labor the soil and to work because of the sin committed in chapter 3. That's not, that's not biblical doctrine. That's not good theology. In reality, Adam, from the very beginning, before Adam's sin, Eve's sin, he was commissioned to a steward to be a manager of the garden. Does, does that make sense? So when it comes to creation, if you remember before sin, Adam is commissioned to name the animals, which is a daunting task. Can you imagine how much creativity you have, to, you have to have to really say, well, that looks like an elephant, that looks like a seal, that looks like, I mean, come on, you know, it's just, it's just amazing. But the concept of work, obviously, is modeled by our very own God. Day one, he created, and it was good. Day two, he created, this is Genesis, right? And it was good. And then what happens at the end? He, he rested. What was the implication that this concept of work has to, in my personal view, and again, I'm not just walking through this because Paul is one of these amazing work-driven individual, um, is that work potentially can be, potentially, just, just listen for a second, can be the catalyst to, for us as a generation, for us as Christians, for us as parents and grandparents, to help the next generation not only to get work ethics, not only to get a work system that is, that is um, honorable to the Lord Jesus, a, a, a lifestyle that avoids laziness and, and non-productive you know, uh, mindsets, but what if work can potentially be the, the vehicle to reconcile, again, in salvation with with uh, sanctification. In other words, to receive the gospel and to embrace the behavior and the thinking and the worldview of this individual, which is the person of Jesus Christ. I, I told you from day one, and now we're at the end of the sermon, but chapter 20 is basically Paul encountering very dear people to him. He's speaking to the elders, to the pastors, to the overseers of the churches in Ephesus. He's at the end of his third missionary journey, which is talking about work. This guy worked, right? So he's at the end, and we said last week and the previous weeks that in his, in his time of coming together, he, he comes into this experience of verse 25 where he says, Now I know, obviously the now is kind of at the closing into the whole thing, that none of you among whom I have gone about, what did he do? He was a preacher. He was an apostle. He was a church planter. He was a missionary. So, so he worked, and watch this. I, I preached the kingdom, and yet, and yet, and again, this is where I want you to kind of... Uh, dialogue between the implication of work, which I hope and you 
had, have, and, 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 and if you need work, hopefully the Lord will provide. But whatever the case may be, watch this. Although he is coming to the end, he's coming to the now, he's coming to this experience where he's saying goodbye to them. This is Acts chapter 20, the end of the third missionary journey. He comes and says, will, uh, will ever see me again? What, what's the implication? Here's what I want you to understand. That although he, Paul, um, was a very good work uh, worker, he was a very good leader, speaking to leaders, pastors and bishops, you know, and, and overseers. Um, he is at the place that he reminds them that faithfulness, responsibility, commitment, which is the preaching of the kingdom, does not imply a does not imply to know the details of the future. The future is secure. He knows exactly where he's going. He just doesn't know the details. I don't know if that makes sense. And I'm bringing this up to you because, again, typically when we work, we're working to something very specific, which for many of us is retirement. For, for people is financial stability. For people is to create a legacy and to provide for the family. All of those things are God-given commands. But as we said from day one, the, the point of this whole thing is not to work. Work is means to an end. What's the end? The end is that, once again, is that we understand that as many nations and countries, they continue to grow in the gap of salvation and sanctification, of embracing Jesus in a disregard of his worldview, potentially for us as a nation, we are, no, let me rephrase that, not potentially. I know we're not doing that either. I know as a nation, we are not embracing the worldview of Jesus all the time. So in this case, what I want you to understand, because again, the, the reflection for me over verse 25 is literally the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Paul is basically saying, I gave my all, I preach, I stayed with you three years in Ephesus, with the churches in Ephesus. He's not in Ephesus, okay? But he called the, the, the elders to come to Ephesus. He called the pastors to come to Ephesus. He says, I was led for, for my journey walking with Jesus by the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit of God created in me the spirit of work. In this concept of work, he says, I preach to you the kingdom. I never deviated to, 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 to the point that he says, because of my tenure, because of my endurance, and because I do not know what's going to happen to me. Now, historically, we know because we are reading from a rear view mirror, he is not coming back. He's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be executed. This is it. This is game over for Paul. He says, therefore, what, what did I do? I declare to you today that I am, what's the word, people? I'm innocent. I'm not guilty of the blood of any of you. So he's speaking from a leadership perspective because he's a pastor to pastors. And he understands that as a pastors, again, pastors, elders, we are responsible for the blood of those that we pastor, that we shepherd. I don't know if you ever heard that before, but if you read the book of Hebrews, that's where you find this reference. So here's the point. He said, I have work, and I have work diligently. I'm, I'm innocent. I don't, have any, I don't have any unfinished business when it comes to the task that was given to me. So, so think about your kids and grandkids as they finish the journey of providing for their families, as they walk into brand new marriages, as many of you celebrate the life that you built in your marriage, or maybe the, 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 the loss of a loved one, whatever the case may be. What if we can come into the place where we can say openly on a day like this, today, I am innocent because I raised my family, I work, I've invested, I, I'm at the place in my life, just like him, that my my faithful work has been rewarded because I have persevered. But my faithfulness and my commitment as a, as a worker, as a leader, as a father, as a wife, has been rewarded not with my persistence, which is honorable. And Paul has been, has been, has been um, commissioned as an apostle who finished the race well. But what, look, look what happens. Your perseverance, your endurance, your commitment, your seal, your drive, your, the way that you are able to perform and do the things you do is simply a vehicle to demonstrate not your faithful work, but the work of the faithful one. In other words, what you have been able to do and you do with your hands, with your mind, with your physical or mental or emotional work as you nurture the home and the grandkids and you love on people is for the purpose not to show how tenacious you are. And I'm glad that you are a generation who stayed the course and, and, and you love to finish your commitments. 
But the purpose is for the world, again, because we just said earlier that it's not simply for our kids and grandkids to know Jesus. It's for them to embrace the behavior of Jesus, and the gap continues to grow. See, here's my point. See? And the reason why it continues to grow is because sometimes, or many times, all that they know is the gospel through our performance. Well, it begins through our performance because we have to share the gospel, and the gospel is openly and, and unapologetically shared through our work ethic. Because Jesus work, I don't know if you ever thought about this, but Jesus was a man's man. Have you ever seen the hands of a carpenter, of someone that works with his hands? Mines are soft because I work with books, and I'm not going to apologize for that. But they're not like my, my hands. People who work with their hands, that's Jesus. Jesus was a, a wood worker. He, 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 he crafted the wood. And, 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 and at the end of the day, his carpentry, Jesus is speaking, Paul, we're going to read later on next week, that he was a tent maker. Remember that? He, he, was, he was a guy who worked as someone that at the end portrays, conveys, not the perseverance, but the God who preserves. Because here's what I told you from day one. If God doesn't preserve you, you're not able to persevere. Does that make sense? If you have been able to persevere, and throughout the years you've met preachers, and you met people and families and deacons that gave up on the journey, you have met people who gave up on their marriages or whatever the case may be. It's not because you're better than them. It's not because I'm better than them. What's the reason? Because in His sovereignty, and this is a mystery, is that God chooses to preserve you. For that, we're eternally grateful. So that creates a dynamic. That creates something that makes you not to be, not to be absent or to be immune from the challenges that we're facing. It's a challenging time today. What do you do in the midst of challenges? What do you do when you're trying to teach the younger generation to persevere? What do you do when you're trying to introduce the gospel by showing the work of the faithful one and how he chooses to preserve? What do you do? This is what you do. You stop. This is, this is the implication. The implication is that Paul speaks to elders or pastors that apparently they were quitting or giving up or they have become hesitant. And Paul says, I have never done that. Now, you may have been hesitant. You may have been a little, you know, uh, iffy. And, and instead of a black and white, you see it color grade. He says, I've never been hesitant to proclaim to you the entire will of God. So this week, accidentally, and it was accidentally, I, I didn't do it on purpose, but I ran into this movie again. Have you ever watched this movie? I'll invite you. It's, it's history, right? It's a historical movie. The Finest Hours. When you read the word hesitant, that I did not hesitate, I did not hesitate. It's the implication that he did not hesitate in the implication of literally going against the waves, against the storm, against the, the force of something. In other words, Paul is not saying, I became an apostle, I was calling to this ministry because everything was just moving and flowing and just everybody liked me and you know and the gospel just created no you, you know this story you know this guy you, you know how the, this whole thing ends historically nero which is the emperor of rome eventually is going to take a brother like paul and is going to decapitate him so it is the implication that through work through our ethics through our commitment to to honor not, not our faithful work, but the work of the faithful one is that we see ourselves moving against the grain. And, and why, why do we do this? It's because the hesitation of Paul is not focused on his, I'm going to say this again, it's not focused on his drive. It's not focused because he's a firstborn, because of his personality and the way he was raised, and Gamaliel, you know, uh, this, this theologian trained him, and he's from, the, from, from this amazing background. The reason is because this, this lack of hesitation, this commitment, this drive is based on conveying, proclaiming the entire will of God. So please listen to me for a second. If you're in this place and you are a part of a generation that did not hesitate, and you're in this place and I know it hasn't been easy, I know you went through valleys and shadows and, and, and difficulties, uh, but yet you are still here, please listen to me for a second. One of the evidences 
of the both end of the conversation, your commitment and his commitment. His commitment, Jesus' commitment of the whole will of God. Jesus is the incarnation of the will of God. You don't, you don't really need to pray for the will of God in a sense of, a, in a sense of uh, you know, some decision making. You look at the character of Jesus and that's what you do. W would you agree to that? Is that a simple statement? I don't think it's easy to do, but here's my point. Once you make your commitment and you see and proclaim His commitment, not just your faithful work, but the work of the, say it, faithful one, this is what happens. You understand that your personal preferences become secondary. That now, in, in other words, your lack of hesitation and your commitment, make sure that doesn't become a badge of entitlement. That now because you worked, now because you invested, you should get it in return. See, that is called the prosperity gospel. Everybody tracking what I'm saying? That concept that if I tithe, so God can bless me. See, we don't tithe or we don't give to get. We give because we have been transformed by the supernatural power of Jesus that before Jesus, I was a taker, now I'm a giver. Does that make sense? So, so watch this, please. So you remove your personal preferences, and nothing wrong with your, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to give you the benefit of the doubt, and I think your personal preferences are good. I, I think you're good people. But look at this. Instead of your personal preferences, now you focus on the person and the preferences of the work and the character of Jesus. Now, folks, if anybody asks you, and some of you need to write this down, this right here is the gospel. The gospel is the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And my argument this morning on behalf of Paul, Paul's argument, speaking to the elders, is that personally, because very few people will ever do what I do, meaning vocationally, the average individual is going to go to an 8 to 5 job, work for X amount of days or years, and then eventually retire, whatever the case may be. Watch this, please. Your job, your personal preferences on retirement and how you went about or how you are teaching your younger generation to go about must be submitted, must be the vehicle to the expansion and the character of the person and the work of Jesus. What's the implication? Watch this, please. That implies that your personal preferences and your, your, your tendencies on, as a school teacher, as a mechanic, as an engineer, whatever the case may be, as a stay-at-home mom, your personal preferences, watch this, cannot be compromised with the character of Jesus. So whatever you decide to do vocationally, Whatever you decide to do in your lifestyle, if it's not matching the person and the work of Jesus, you're wrong. And you have to repent. You have to turn around and walk in the opposite direction. See, Paul said, I'm innocent. I have nothing, nothing to, to really that you have on me because I kept the course. I, I understood that personally I was on the road to Damascus to kill Christians. And what happens in Acts chapter 9? My personal preferences were switch around. By what? Not by a better, by a better choice of personal preferences. What, what happened on Acts chapter 9? My personal preferences were crucified, were destroyed, and now something else came into me, which is now not personal preferences, but the person and eventually the work of Jesus Christ. He, 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 tip, he, he simply ends the conversation with this. And when I say end, we're going to end right here, okay? I promise you. This is it. I don't have any more verses to show. But he basically says this. Now that you have gotten over yourselves, now that you are willing to stay the course and to use your 30, 40, 50 years of work, and now you're in a different stage in life or whatever, whatever you are, now, he is going to argue, Paul is going to argue, this is where the fun begins. This is where life begins. You may have think that, you know, coming to retirement is for you to settle. No. See, see I, I don't know if you saw it at the beginning, but I, I, I meant to show it now. But one of the books, that, this is a book that we gave to men, to our fathers back in Father's Day. It's called Don't Waste Your Life. It's written, we're going to do this in the study for men. You guys have inside the bulletin a handout with our Bible studies. And we're going to study this because what he is going to argue, John Piper, is going to argue that when you hit retirement, it should be the most exciting time to do this, to keep watch. This is the time where you have to be fully aware. And obviously, he begins with yourselves and then with the flock. So a healthy pastor typically leads healthy churches. 
A healthy marriage typically raises healthy children. And I say typically because there is exceptions to the rule, and I understand you go case by case. But all that I'm trying to tell you is that when it comes to this command that he has given to these shepherds to keep watch, is that although you have followed my instructions, although I have modeled this for you, here is the understanding. You have to keep watch, and, and we're going we're gonna to see in just a minute the why and how do we do this, is because here's what he reminds us. When and as you work, that reminds you that you are a steward. When you go into the opposite of work, which is laziness, you continue to grow into entitlement because you behave like an owner. You behave like the government owns you, and that's why we have a broken system in the United States that people who should be working are not working. Oh, come on. Okay, never mind. Here we go. Let's go. So, so, so think about this. It's a matter of a stewardship. It's a matter of us reflecting the heart of God as a steward of this. So, so you keep watch because as you continue to prosper financially, as you continue to fulfill your dreams economically and relationally, make sure that you don't move from a steward to owner. The only owner is Jesus Christ. You know, we, we are in sales, he's in management. It, it is the concept that we have to continue to work for the purpose to expanding, you know, this concept of a stewardship. And then he specifically says, obviously, you keep watch of keeping yourself as a steward, not as an owner. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to say that again. Uh, when it comes to tithing, just my quick pastoral commercial. When it comes to tithing, for us as Christians, the goal is not to tithe. I'm glad you do. I'm glad you are thinking about doing it. And you can do percentages. If you cannot afford 10%, you can begin with 1%, 2%. It's a matter of the heart. Look at me for a second. See, once you begin with this tithing, the goal is not tithing. The goal is to honor, is to honor a stewardship with 90% that we get to manage. See, giving or bringing 10% before the Lord, it's not so you can do whatever you please with the 90%. Tra tracking what I'm saying? Because for most of us, the issue has never been income. The issue is a stewardship. I don't know if that makes any sense. Well, here's the point. He simply says, hey, you got to do this and watch over the flock of which, here's, I mean, he, here's where he just nails the whole thing as he dismisses these elders. Because the Holy Spirit, it wasn't your giftedness, it wasn't your calling, it wasn't your education, it wasn't because you are the son of so-and-so. It was the Holy Spirit that made, made you an overseer a pastor, a shepherd, in this case speaking to the leadership of the church. And now that you are a shepherd of the church, whose church? Who owns the church? Who owns the church, people? Who owns your marriage? Who owns your children? Who owns the money that you have or that you used to have in, in, your, in, in your bank? Who owns it all? Does that make sense? Stewardship, ownership? He says, you have to understand that this is the experience that keeping watch is over this whole scenario because he reminds these people that it is his calling, his church, which he, who is he? The God, the Spirit, the one who commissioned you. He bought this church. He bought the flock. He bought yourselves with his own blood. The year is 1999. I'm a pastor at First Baptist Church in Port Isabel. We are at the Alamo Dome in San Antonio at a youth conference. About 16,000 kids just rocking the place. This is 99. I was size 28, lots of hair, and it was black. Good old days. And I remember... I remember, this is in June. This is the Youth Evangelism Conference by the BGCT, the convention. People from all over the place. In the middle of the whole deal, this is the month of June, they stop the whole thing. And they just go in the big jumbo screens in the center. This is where the Spurs used to play basketball at the Alamo Dome. They stop the conference and they go live on the big screens into New York uh, 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 um, um, Square Garden. Madison Square Garden. And that is in, on that night, at that moment, began the celebration because the San Antonio Spurs won their first championship against the New York Knicks in New York. So we're in San Antonio, 
home of the Spurs, Spurs. We are in the Alamo Dome. They stop. Everything goes dark. Big screen comes, and there's a celebration. There's Tim Duncan. There's uh, David Robinson holding the trophies, and it's just the place goes crazy. And then suddenly there's a spotlight that shows on the screen, and there's the coyote. I don't know if you've seen the coyote, the mascot for the Spurs. And he's going across the whole stage with the flag celebrating. When the Bible says that he bought his own blood, Jesus bought it with his own blood, that is the concept of substitution. That is the concept that Jesus did something on behalf of others. So although we were in San Antonio, although we were in the Alamo Dome, the home of the Spurs, although we were with the coyote with the mascot, and although we were celebrating, we didn't play the game. We just celebrated. Does that make sense? It was, it was the, the, the 12, 15 guys on the court after a long season and a long series against the Knicks. Back in those days, the Knicks were amazing also. And, and, and Tim Duncan and David Robinson and Avery Johnson, all those guys, they just, they just took this whole thing into that experience. They are the ones who, who actually pay the price. We simply celebrated. Does that make sense? So last year, think about it, because last year, last year, some of you may remember this, the Eagles, you know, got the Super Bowl. And I don't know if you've ever seen this, and I invite you to Google later, but Will Smith, the actor, he's from Philadelphia, he went crazy. Kevin Hart, you know, this comedian, he went crazy, but they didn't play. Does that make sense? They just celebrated somebody else's victory. When the Bible says that Jesus bought this church, this flock, your abilities, your essence, who you are, is exactly the same concept that the price was paid for him. You get the right to celebrate. You get the right to enjoy this beautiful thing that is pretty interesting that this process of purchasing us with his blood. I mean, if you think about it, it begins as a little baby when when, when he is literally circumcised. And then at the beginning of his ministry, he goes to John the baptizer, and he is what? Now, John says, whoa, 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 time out, time out, time out. You're asking me to baptize you when you are the Lamb of God? You are the one that is before me and after me, and I'm not even worthy to, unto, to, to tie up your sandals? And Jesus said, listen to me. The reason why you need to baptize me, watch this, please, because it's connected to this. You need to baptize me. Although baptism was for forgiveness or redemption of sins, did Jesus sin? No. So did Jesus need to be baptized? In that regard, he didn't. Why did he get baptized? Because Jesus was going to eventually purchase his church, purchase those who were to be saved by fulfilling the righteousness, the demands of the righteous God. The law said that you have to be circumcised, that you have to be baptized to have access to God. So when Jesus fulfilled those two practices, circumcision and baptism, it's not because of his sin, it's because someone else's sin. It's what we call a foreign imputation, an exchange that today you have the opportunity to give your sin to Jesus, and through his righteousness, he gives you his ability to be purchased, not because you deserve to be purchased, not because you deserve to, not not because you played the game. Now, he played the game. He didn't play the game. He's just celebrating. So stop thinking that you are the one who, you did not purchase yourself. You did not pay the price because you don't have the ability to purchase yourself. Does that make sense? It is Jesus of Nazareth who bought you, who purchased you, who's given you the opportunity this morning to walk into this experience of knowing the resurrected Christ. Will you please stand on your feet?